Hello people, I am Bharat Acharya. Welcome to our new lecture. Today in C programming, we are doing something very interesting. We are solving the entire question paper of VDU University. The name of the subject is Problem Solving Through Programming. That's basically C programming. Uh, this is a subject code. I have been running this campaign amongst my whole community where I've been asking students, give me your question papers across various subjects that I teach. I teach a lot of subjects, they're all listed below. Anyway, and I've been solving their question papers. The last video I made was for Calcutta University for microprocessors because I found that paper very interesting. This paper is one wonderful paper that I've seen amongst all that I came, uh, that I got from my students. Um, the reason why I'm saying it because this one paper has so many questions. Hear this out. Uh, palindrome, factorial, Fibonacci, uh, GCD, LCM, uh, roots of a quadratic equation. Uh, yeah, have you heard of these questions? These are the ones that are asked in all these universities. Binary search, selection sort, all of this is there in one single paper. I was like, wow, what a super paper to give to a student to prepare last minute. You have an exam coming up in two weeks, three weeks, probably next week. Uh, probably a month from now and you want your that final preparation that summary sir give us one thing that I need to do so I'm sure I will do well in the exam certainly pass in fact do well and uh, probably do really well if you are from this university because we know how engineering works uh, if you have the whole solution of the previous year's paper if you understood every question no options every question then you're very well set for your exam because generally about 30 to 40 percent of the questions are directly repeated. Another 15 to 20, maybe in some universities, maybe 30 percent to questions are indirectly repeated with the questions pretty much the same. Just the wordings are changed, probably some equations are changed, etc. A method of sorting would change, but it still be a sorting question as an example. So the idea is from uh, my experience of teaching engineering students for now, what, more than 22 years? Uh, I know how important it is for a student also to build his or her confidence to know the full solution of the previous year's paper. And when it comes especially to a paper like programming, where all of these kind of programs are asked, to learn all of them from one single source, from one thought process, from one way of writing programs, just makes it very easy. Programming is, is easy. All subjects that I teach, if you look down, they all have programming. Most of them are microprocessors, some are microcontrollers. All of them, the programming language is different in the sense the instructions are different, the way you write the program, the interface and all, everything is different. But the essence of programming is the same. So I say this in all my subjects. If you know programming in one language, you know programming. You know the skill of working with arrays, sorting, finding the highest, creating functions, calling functions, passing parameters. These are skills of programming. You learn them in one language, you learned it. Then when you move from one language to the other, all you need to understand is the nuances, the syntax of that language and the new features that the language offers. But the core essence of a programmer is already with you once you do programming in one language properly. All right. Now, something about the question paper before we start. Uh, this, like I said, is the code of the subject. So if this matches with you. This is bang on for you. If it doesn't match, say you're from Delhi University or Calcutta University. You just heard all the questions that I said. Experience uh, is the best teacher. I know these are the questions that come in C programming, no matter which university you are. So I was looking for one good paper that has maximum covered and I was amazed at how many of them are covered in this paper. In fact, there are more than what I said. So because this is a hundred mark paper, proper three hours, there are 10 questions. You have to attempt five. There are 10 questions. Each question has two to three sub questions. So there's about 22 to 23, 25 questions altogether. That just shows how much you cover. So this one single session takes care of your preparation. I'm not saying only do this. No, no, no. That's not even the approach a student should use. You learn the subject like you're supposed to learn. I made the whole course of C programming. There are 30 plus videos. You understand each video is about half an hour, 45 minutes. Some of them one hour, some of them more than that. So yes, you learn the whole subject in detail. But learning the subject is one thing and preparing for a certain exam is another thing altogether. When you're preparing for the exam, you ought to know what came last year, what is asked in other universities, how it is going to be in your, you get an idea how your paper is going to be and you also understand how much effort it takes to solve one full paper. 
all right anyway let's go ahead especially c programming comes in first and second semester so in this university the semesters keep altering so you may get this subject in the first sem or in the second sem both of them it's the exact same subject but if you so you have that selection the option of taking it first sem or second sem so basically because c programming comes in first year this is big very different from the other subjects that i teach which come in second year third year fourth year engineering so you students are very fresh in the engineering system you come out of 10 12 you seen that hectic very competitive environment and you did well that's how you grabbed your engineering seat when we took engineering we thought we'd be learning real science and then we understand that we are still learning the same physics the same chemistry just a few chapters more the same maths yeah those are the cluster of subjects which for many people are outdated and but anyway they are there in the university and you learned it but there are some fun subjects in first year and this is one of those subjects yeah it is like that if you're scared of programming that's only because you're not learning it properly once you get a handle on it once you cross that initial barrier programming is a lot of fun all right now let's begin uh, first of all your question number 1 which is a part of module 1 so the 10 questions are divided into five modules each module has module has two questions obviously so you got to attempt attempt one question from each module this is the smart thing that they've done in this paper hats off to the people who set this kind of pattern so each module covers a certain chapter of the syllabus you can't attempt any five questions from the paper because if you give given that kind of flexibility you attempt the first five questions which means you've done only your first half of the syllabus and get away like how many people just ignore some chapters you can't do that in this paper because you got to attempt a question from every module which means they have covered the whole syllabus so you have to know every part of the syllabus nicely some parts much nicer some parts probably you could take a chance but overall you need to know the whole syllabus when you go for an exam like this so this is module 1 where question number 1 has two parts i'll show you question number 1 and question number 2 you decide which one you want to attempt as you are the student of course i'm going to teach you both but you have to decide which one to attempt i'll tell you which one i would anyway first discuss the various generations of computers history question it's got nothing to do with programming but yes if you're a computer engineering student you should or even if you're an engineering student learning programming you should know how computers evolved so it's more of history there's nothing much to explain i would love to explain though but the things are so obsolete in this that uh, you know vacuum drums and uh, magnetic tapes and things like that which have no local standard in the today in the modern computer world so even learning so much about them beats the whole purpose of learning the subject but anyway at least superficially you need to know the history so that's why this question is there then the other one again a full theory question right basic structure of a c program yes it is about your c program but it's not writing a program it's a structure of a c program so this is how the university gives that helping hand to students who find programming a little tough okay you program find programming tough no problem we have given you some theory questions you keep writing but at least you will get some marks and you will certainly pass anyway so these are both non programming related question or non programming questions It's all theory if you like to write a lot this is what you'll be attempting i won't not because of any other reason but because the second question is fabulous this is what brings a smile to the face of a programmer this is what you want to attempt anyway first super question uh, differentiate between primary and secondary memory though this is not c programming but like i said for a person who's learning programming especially someone who's from first second semester which is your introduction to computers you should know this because of my reach where i teach students from different semesters in fact some students come to me right at the end of engineering as a project guide it's appalling to see students know programming students know a lot of things but they still don't know what is primary and secondary memory if they ask you such questions practical questions in your interview the memory that is there in your phone what is that which is the primary part of the memory which is the secondary part of the memory you can't answer that what's the point of doing four years of engineering getting that degree and getting awesome marks if you just don't know such basics so yes it's a super question though it's more of a coa question than a c programming but i'm very glad that whoever said the paper has put this question so i will be explaining this to you in detail uh the next one this is a programming question explain logical operators or basically logic operators of c you know what are logic operators and or not and then there is a program given where you have to decide its output and give with reasons not just the output which you can use look here and there right with reasons this is the kind of question 
you will find in any competitive exam all right whether it's gate whether it's brc anything where c programming is there you will find or isro you will find such kind of questions this is how they test people you will also find them in your placements during your placement yeah it's far you still in early days in engineering but we all have that one goal i was placed through college way back in the year 2000 where placement was very scanty you had to be in the top college and in that in the top grade to get placed today that's not the case india is the software hub of the world we run the world software so there is ample opportunity at the same time there is also much more competition during my time bombay in the mumbai university circuit there were about what uh, 12 colleges today there are 40 plus so you get the point anyway anyway i'm sure the same is same is with your vicinity anyway so coming back um so they've given you a program you got to find out what happens for this you need to have a good command or logic instruction so i'm going to give you the answer but not just to show you the answer i will run this on the computer in the c programming uh, environment the ide we will get see the answer over there and verify with what we have decided to be the correct answer plus i will make changes to the program because you may not get the exact same question something around this you may get so i'm going to make the changes so that you are sure that you can handle anything that comes in and around logic instructions in your exam all right and the last question is basic data types of c basic data types every programmer needs to know that once data types where you have user defined data types like arrays two dimensional arrays and then strings and then uh, structures unions those are advanced data types they are not asking those all right don't write those this is basic data types character integer float and its various sub types all right so this is your question number 1 and 2 out of which you have to attempt one needless to say i'm sure by now you guessed it if it's me writing this exam i'll be attempting this because this is the question which i would want to get full mark look at the number of marks you got 10 marks for this because they know most students just look at this something like this and try to do the other question but those who know programming this is super simple you can answer this in your sleep anyway shall we begin your first question explain the various generations of computers so there were five generations of computers this is history i am not going to go too much into detail neither do you need to you need to know the generation so that's where we'll end it before we go ahead tell me the definition of a computer modern computer don't look there hello don't look there we're not here to buy hard we're here to discuss come on speak up uh, a computer is an electronic device you sure about that earlier in the lower uh, the first second generations there were a lot of physical components to a computer now which have all become pure electronics so it's an electronic device it works on a program you agree with me everything in a computer is a program do you agree me talking over here and being recorded the audio recording is done by a program the video recording is done by a program it's stitched together by a program saved as a file uh, displayed on the screen by another program the video player you're downloading it from various places social media platforms that is another program and so on you listen to music you watch a movie you are whatsapp you are instagram all or youtube they are all programs all right they are apps that you install application programs anyway so a computer is an electronic device it works on a program what does it do it accepts some inputs like the, for this camera my face is the input for the microphone my voice is the input so on processes it converts what it sees into digital information which is a process so fabulous you learn in higher electronics i teach it so i know how wonderful it is you learn it in higher subjects anyway and then makes a file out of it stores it in the memory and whenever required generates an output all right so repeat the definition from me with me don't look there okay the first person you cheat in the world is yourself don't look there look look here i am looking straight at you go look at me come on first thing it's a what kind of device electronic device what does it do it works on programs it accepts inputs processes them stores the information and generates an output are you clear you may twist the words but the essence is the same so this is how a modern computer is but what you see today is not what it was uh, conceived to be when they created the first computer the people who created them didn't have an idea that it's going to become like this it's going to run our lives it was more like a scientific experiment then it became a war necessity if you watch the movie imitation game you will know what happened and how the first computer finally came into the world anyway uh, so i'm not going to go into the details i'm just going to write the main points you may pause and take a screenshot you know how to pause a video and take a screenshot that in many times so uh, these are the bullet points that i have which you should have in your answer the age the era where this was created like i said it was second world war so it was the 
40s, early 40s, going up to the mid, mid 50s. That's the era of the first generation of computers. It used vacuum tubes. Now, just to give you a very brief idea, I'm not going to go into the details. Vacuum tubes, you can understand, are tubes of vacuum. Why do you need that? To pass electrons. Get the idea. Everything in computer processing is zeros and ones, binary. Are you clear? You want to do 2 plus 3 as an example. 2 is 0, 0, 1, 0. 3 is 0, 0, 1, 1. Add them, it will be 0, 1, 0, 1. That is fine. I just give you the simplest example. You don't even need to verify the addition. You just have to hear what I'm saying. Everything in computers is zeros and ones. All right. So in that vacuum tube, whatever processing you have to do, you have to eventually send a zero or a one. That was done by sending electrons. Why a vacuum tube? So that the electron doesn't get deviated. It has a state part to go. It doesn't get affected by anything else. Anyway, that was the idea using. So you understand there's so much physics. Physicists were the ones who made computers, to be honest. So there was so much physics involved in this process rather than electronics, which was not even born at that time. The raw electronics form that you see today. So that was that era. Uh, ENIAC was the name of the first computer. Uh, the input out, these are the physical numbers. Like, okay, you want me to explain a little bit more? The size, the space that it took is bigger than uh, most average city houses. Probably two homes in a city, two flats in a city would be this size. I'm talking about average sizes. So you know the size of your house, so you get the idea to you, yours and your neighbor's house. That was the size of the whole system. You'll see it in that movie if you just want a picture of it or just. Google vacuum tubes, you'll see how it looks like. Anyway, so those were not computers used for entertainment. Entertainment, media, all of this came much later. Steve Jobs, uh, Bill Gates. These were the people who changed the shape of modern computing, but computers were not created by them. They were created much earlier. Alan to Turing, anyway. So uh, one interesting thing I want you to know is the input output. So today how you have keyboard and mouse and uh, all these kind of input devices, your pen drives and all. Uh, back then, A, the data was not so much. The data was very little. It was numbers which were given, but those numbers were given in the form of punched cards. Again, why punched cards? Same idea. 2 is 0, 0, 1, 0. So you create slots. Don't punch, don't punch, punch, don't punch. That becomes 0, 0, 1, 0. You getting my idea? That punch and not punch is a 1 or a 0. And based on that, you curate information on a card and you give the card inside. That's how information gives. There is that primitive. That was the era, the first generation of computers. And the output again was on paper in a punch form, which you had to read. Uh, if you ever done semaphores or Morse code, that's how, like how did dot, did dot, did dot. That's how the output used to be there. And only specialized people who know how to read that language could read it because it is not a mass product, it is not for the layman. Then the second generation, those big size vacuum tubes were replaced by transistors. This is the birth of modern electronics. You're in first year, you've not learned transistors. When you go to second year, third year, you will learn them a lot. Sadly, uh, many a time students who come to me in third year and finish learning transistors in second year, they can solve any derivation of transistors. But you ask them in the class, what does the transistor do? No idea. Why do you learn it? No idea. What's the point of such knowledge? What's the point of getting all that, all those degrees and those marks in your certificate if you can't answer basic questions in an interview? Then that knowledge is of no use. Anyway, transistors, when you learn them, they have various purposes. The most basic purpose, I'm going to keep it short and simple, is it is an electronic device which can switch any line between logic 1 and logic 0. This is VCC, this is ground, this is the line where based on the input you can connect this line to logic 1 and logic 0. What did I say? What were the vacuum tubes doing? Passing 1s and zeros. The same thing now is done by transistors at the two ends of a wire. Based on what you want to send, you either bias it to 1 or to 0 and that information travels and goes and does the same thing at the other end. That's how information is transferred on those cords that you connect to your computer and your phone and then you transfer files. Anyway, anyway, so this transistors is what revolutionized computers. A, the space requirement became small. B, power requirement was small. You didn't need those specialized equipments to create that vacuum and do all those things. C, the speed became super fast. The transfer of information. When you learn about transistors, like I said, you do all those derivations. You will do them in second year, third year. 
all that is the switching time, the biasing time between BCC and ground, that is logic 1 and logic 0 and you'll know that all this happens in milliseconds, in fact microseconds and that is how microprocessors, microcomputing, these words came into picture. In fact today it happens in nanoseconds, all this technology got better and better over the years, obviously. You know every new generation of phone or a computer is faster than the previous one. So what is making it faster? all of these developments anyway. So the main key highlight is transistors. IBM is a company that started in international business machines. Uh, this company played a lot of, a big role in getting computers on the table of the common person. Anyway, still punch cards and tapes, magnetic tapes, where magnetic strips were used. Magnetic strips. What are they containing? Zeros and ones. A magnet has a North Pole and a South Pole. Yeah, by now you understood this. A North Pole 1 or South Pole 0 or vice versa. However you do it, that doesn't matter. Basically, you've got two poles and you have a head. It reads information from those strips and that's how it gets zeros and ones. At the end of the day, all the information that you transfer, read or write, is all zeros and ones. And different technologies were created just to pass all this information. Uh, CDs and DVDs, yeah, they're, they're today are obsolete. Even for the current generation, they're obsolete. But we were the kids who have moved from the generation of audio cassettes going into CDs and being a music buff all my school life, school life, so I'm talking about mid 80s to early 90s was audio cassettes, Michael Jackson, Madonna, all the, the, the kids of that era. So we had audio cassettes of all of them and then they moved to CDs and when you move to a CD you realize in an audio cassette max you can store 12 songs, 6 this side, 6 the other side, there was a forward and reverse side basically two sides of the tape. You got that, right? That much common sense you have. Anyway, so uh, yeah, so from 12 songs, it, just, we just, it was a revolution. A CD can hold 100 songs and forget 100. You look at a CD and I used to be so curious, how is it storing information? If I look at a CD, I can see my face because it has that reflective screen. So where is that? Where are the songs stored? Then you learn it uh, in a subject called COITs that. Uh, it has two surfaces, lines and bits, of course, they're microscopic. Light is thrown based on how the light reflects back. You come to know whether it's logic 1, logic 0. It's not like land and bit logic 1, logic 0. It's the transition in the flat line that decides whether light is coming back or not. And that's how a 1 and a 0 is read. At the end of the day, it's still 1, 0. It's the same concept, but done in different ways. And because those CDs could have very microscopic lines and bits, they could hold tremendous amount of information in those circuits. And that's why a CD has to rotate. I'm sure you know that, right? When you pull a CD out of CD drive, you eject it. You see it's still spinning because it has those circular tracks anyway. So CDs came later. That's optical memory. This is all still magnetic and physical punch cards. So this was a transistor era. So this is 50s going into mid 60s. There's no exact year. Okay, 1964, we decide we go into third year or third uh, generation of computers. No, it's not like that. It's over the years. So one company tried something. It didn't work, the other company made it better, didn't work, the other company made it better, worked and then other companies adopted it and that's how gradually you move from one generation to the other. So if you wiki this or if you google this, you may find a year up or down, that doesn't matter. They are not fixed hard and fast years, it's basically the decades of computers. Then the mid 60s to mid 70s, combining those transistors, ICs came into picture, that is integrated circuits, the chips that you see on the motherboard of a computer. Those were invented where thousands, then tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of transistors were integrated. Millions, from thousands it went up to millions over the years, okay? Each transistor is capable of creating a flip-flop. You'll learn this thing later, but I'm not gonna go too much into electronics because you don't know them, so it'll just sound weird, but I'm just giving you the gist. So using those transistors, microcircuits were created and using those circuits, programming or uh, processing used to happen. Storage also used to happen in memory chips using similar kind of circuits. Each cell of information started requiring lesser and lesser space. Not meters, not centimeters, not millimeters, micrometers, also called microns. Today, it's got even smaller and getting smaller by the generation, by the year and going into nanometers. That's what you hear. 9 nm technology, 7 nm technology. I think the new Apple uh, chip is coming out with a 3 nm technology. Crazy, that 3 nanometers. What does that mean? Uh, a nanometer is a billionth, yeah, billionth of a 
uh, meter, a billionth of a meter. So three nanometers means three billionths of a meter. So do you understand in just one single line of a meter, how many million transistors can be stored? And it's not just one line. Now this becomes line after line after line in that small chip. So it's layers over layers over layers. So in that one single chip, they could store millions and billions of transistors creating more the trans. So what happens when you have more transistors, you have more processing power, more juice. That is how these processors become faster. So whenever you hear a 5nm processor compared to a 3nm processor, you know the 3nm processor will be faster. Why? Because it's taking less space per, per single cell of information or single cell of circuit. That means it can have more circuitry, more the circuitry, more the processing power. As simple as that. So also what is more is as they get tinier, there is more space between the circuits between the small internal microscopic circuits. Because there is more space, that's easier heat dissipation. Easier heat dissipation means they don't get overheated in simple layman's language. That is why when Apple changed to M1 in the, uh, the, the Air series of the Macs, the MacBook Airs, there was no fan. Unbelievable. A, it is faster than every other processor. B, it doesn't even have a fan. It's unbelievable. Every other processor at half that performance starts throttling. Throttling means overheating and then reducing its performance to save its own life. But there is no fan. That's the guts they had because they had gone so small into the processing cells. So that, that's how that small, so that 5 nanometers and 4 nanometers and 3 nanometers, that's how it makes the difference. So less heating, better power consumption, uh, more performance and so on. But all that happened much later. At this point of time, it was still microns, still microns. And this gave birth to the subject that I love to teach most of these microprocessors. All of this put together in that single chip microprocessors and then gave microcontrollers with even memory and IO inside the single chip. And this is what revolutionized. Now, this is where computer sizes became very small and you could start creating still not laptops but desktops and home PCs and computers came to the layman and when it came to the layman to make it more sellable and to make it more attractive these beautiful minds Steve Jobs, Bill Gates they created media that's this is the generation when songs and movies and games started happening. Still not the flourishing industry that you see today, but starting ha started happening. The, the seeds were sown. Mario, remember? Anyway, then the new generation, the generation that we are living in. We've seen the power of a microprocessor by the fourth generation. Fifth generation is combining multiple microprocessors. Where is the second microprocessor placed? Maybe next to it, maybe on the next table, maybe across the country. Why? Because now you have internet. This is the generation of the internet, the World Wide Web, where you can do cloud computing. We can do computing with multiple processors put together, working at different places in the world. And AI, the future, the sixth generation will be all AI taken by you. You are the ones, You people who are doing engineering today will be the ones who will be, will be shaping the next generation of computers and hopefully I'll still be there to teach that and be so proud that my own students are so involved. I've been doing this for 20 years so yes, a lot of them already are. Many of them are placed in fabulous companies at very big positions. Anyway, that's a separate thing. You check that out and all my cross-reference on my uh, various social media. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is, yes, processors today have become super powerful. It's more, no longer just the power of one processor. It's a cumulative power of all processors working together in a cloud computing platform. Anyway, anyway. So all modern devices, in fact, devices became, uh, uh, they changed the face. Earlier, everything was wired. Those physical laptops that you see, they were wired. They weren't working on running power. Today, most devices, most computing devices work on stored power, whether it's your laptop or your iPad or your tablet or your phone or your watch or whatever it is. They work on stored power. So power consumption took a very big leap uh, the efficiency of power consumption and was the center of discussion when new processors were being made. And that is where again going smaller and smaller in a single cell makes power consumption better because less travel time, less heating and various other factors which I already told you about. Anyway, so this was just a brief history. Like I said, I would love to dwell into many of them and give you more knowledge about it. But most of these things have become so obsolete that uh, except for of course this current generation that discussing them in detail is just more like history than really learning something. 
to build in the future. Anyway, so that was your question number one. Brief history of computers. I'm sure at each point you've taken a screenshot. If you are in, on my website, you don't need to do all that. You have all of the notes available all the time on PDF form. But if you're watching in any free, free platform, then I'm sure you've taken all those screenshots that you need. Now, structure of a C program. Have you seen a C program so far? If you're watching this video, likely you are coming closer to your exam, right? That's when you see your last year's question paper, which means your semester is at least halfway through. So you've seen a C program. So what do you remember? If I tell you this, okay, I'm taking your interview right now. Okay, it's a company interview, your placement is happening. Tell me the structure of a C program. What all is there inside? They are main, of course, that's the main part of the program. But there are many other things. These are all the things that are there in a C program. What, you think uh, you don't know them? You know all of them. It's just that they sound different. Look here. This is how you know them. The documentation section are the comments. Do you write comments? Very good practice. Either at the top of the program, writing the brief logic, the author, the purpose of the program, at the bottom, writing the future developments with the limitations, etc. Next to every line, you do single line comments. You don't write comments next to every line because that's silly, but you write comments on lines which are, which have a little complex logic, which someone else who's reading the program may not directly understand. But if you just put a simple comment on it, it just makes it easier. Do I write comments when I write programs? Uh, when I teach programming in all these processors, the assembly language programming, I always write comments on every line because those, those are instructions which are not obvious to understand. Like in C program, you write A is equal to B plus C. It is very clear what it's doing. A is B plus C. But those assembly language instructions, especially for some processors, have very uh, funny names like XLAT. What did I do? <laughs> no, you'll never know till the time you either know the instruction or somebody writes a simple comment next to it. Okay, this word being XLAT anyway stands for translate. <laughs> anyway, anyway, coming back. So yes, you do write comments, not for yourself, but for the sake of someone who's reading your program so that the he or she is in sync with your idea. They know what you're doing. Link section. Link section is your hash includes. You know you begin every C program with a hash include, right? What are you doing? You're including library functions. You're including header files which have those library functions. What does that mean? I'll tell you very simply. There are some functions that every programmer will need in his or her program. Like a printf or a scanf. You need to show something on the screen. You need to take something from the user. Alright? So you know that everybody needs these functions. Now you can create your own printf. I'm sure you know that. If you didn't know, now you know it. You can create your own printf. But why would you do it? Why reinvent the wheel? Why waste time on doing something that's already done and tested and perfectly working? So, the people who created C created these library functions, the standard functions and put them in header files. And I've told you, when you want so and so set of functions, include the particular header file like standard std io.h, standard io.h is used for printf scanf. There's c o n i o. Please don't say conio and things like that. You see that, you see those um, people on these free platforms and using those words and like, you're like, what are you doing? Either teach or don't waste people's time. Don't, don't give such kind of, don't make it so trivial. Anyway, anyway, there's a big difference between a teacher and a person who's just trying to, whatever. So, uh, yeah, that's console io, on io.h, that is console io.h. You use that for get ch and various other console related functions, which you will, when if at all you do, you use them, then you'll know them. There are math io.h, which you use for complex mathematics, not basic add, subtract, but complex mathematics, like square root or power or things like that. Anyway, so if you want to include those functions in your program, you don't need to write those functions yourself. Just include the header file. Those functions come into your file. That whole program comes into your file, embeds into your file. So the final size of your file will increase, but you don't need to write all that. That just You just have to include the file. Definition section. You define constants. Let's do this. All right? So this is definition section. I've just run through the names. I'll run through the simple theory. You can take screenshots and then we'll directly look at a program. It'll become much easier. So there is a definition section where you define constants. Okay, let me keep it simple. There's a global declaration section where you define global variables. So that can be used all through the program. There's your main function that runs your actual program. And there is sub program section where you have your user defined function. Now let me just show you all of them properly. Come. Uh, I've written notes about each one of them, screenshot. So comments, you can write comment like this. If it's a single line comment, you can write like this. If it's a multi-line comment. 
uh, include standard I/O, console I/O, uh, Mac I/O, etc. There are various others. Uh, there's DOS dot H, Time dot H. These are the ones you use. Standard Library dot H, and so on. String dot H. Uh, this is how you define define a constant. I'll show you its use. I'm just giving you these screens so that you can screenshot so that you have your answers ready for you. Uh, global declarations where you create your global variables. Uh, main. This is it. The main function. This is how you write main function. Void because it if it's not returning a data type. If it's returning a data type, you write int. Preferably write int, but you can write void also. Doesn't matter. It works. <laughs> and then you can have your own functions. You can give it any name you want. So I've given the name my my function. You can call it what you want. All right. These are the parts of your program. Now I have shown you a C program. This is a sample C program. Come on, focus. If you're very fast, take a glance and see what the program is doing. Yes, it's finding the area of a circle. Now, if you don't want people to go through the pain of doing all this, you put a title somewhere in your program. Like I've put area of a circle, you can put it at various places. Now, let's start from the top. Uh, this is professional habit. You will obviously not have it now, but start building it because you want to be a professional. Uh, in your company, you'll always do it. At the top of the program, you write a title, the author, that the person who's written the program, this is where the buck stops if something goes wrong. Uh, the subtitle as to what the program is all about. So I've written VTU, that's your university, your question paper in the year August 22, last year's paper. Now, so that was your description where you write your comments. You have multi-line comments, you have single line comments where you're writing everywhere. You can write single line comments at various places. Now your link section where you are doing hash include. Now the only include file I'm including is standard IO because I'm not using any other function. I'm just using printf and scanf. So standard IO will do the job for me. So this is how you write it. Are you clear? Hash define. Uh, I have created a constant. Now listen very carefully. Uh, you will hear this okay, from your teachers. I'm sure you have very good teachers in your college. They are. Okay. Uh, partly it's their responsibility to pour out all the knowledge to you. Partly it's your responsibility to be good enough to absorb the knowledge and seek more from them. Okay, it's a two-way uh, system, two-way street. So uh, I'm sure your teacher has told you, if something is not going to change in a program, define it as a constant, like pi. Have you heard this? Good. Have you asked your teacher why? Why create a constant? Why not use a variable? Do you know the difference between a variable and a constant? A constant is something which is constant in the whole program, hence the name. A variable is something that varies, hence the name. So, uh, people say, why use a constant? If I, if I declare it as a variable, I still have the flexibility of changing it whenever I want to. Why use it as a constant? Uh, these are the things that differentiate an average programmer from the good ones. The people who get normal jobs from the ones who get the best jobs that come to the college. You want to be in the top category, build correct concepts right from the beginning of the journey. The journey is very long, but the concepts, the tone is set much earlier. A good programmer doesn't become a good programmer at the end of the fourth year. No, I've taught enough to say this with authority. These habits are laid right in the beginning of the journey and during the journey. Are you clear? Not right at the end. Well, you don't transform in that four days before the interview. No, you don't. You may pretend to, but you don't. Uh, and that's caught very easily when the interview stuff, which will be because it is for top companies. So coming back, uh, the difference between an average employee and the ones who keep getting promoted and gets the top jobs very quickly and gets the best projects and travels all over the world are the ones who write efficient programs. I give a same program to you and I give a same program to your colleague. She has got the same result as you, but her program is executing faster. Definitely she is doing something better. Today speed is the name of the game. That is what is making new phones sell. They are not just becoming fast by the hardware. It's also the OS that keeps getting better, which means the program keeps getting better. So speed is a very important factor. That will make a difference or that will be the consequence of declaring pi as a variable or a constant. Now, if you declare pi as a variable, you think you have the flexibility that you can change it, but you're never going to change it. The value of pi is the same. 
but you declare it as a variable. Now, when you have a variable, the compiler or the processor knows that it's a variable. That means its value can change. That means every reference to pi, everywhere you have used pi in the program, the program will actually go to the memory, to the actual location where pi is stored, pick up its value at that point of time and bring it to the program because pi is a variable. So it can change. So I am pi and that variable, you are the program. You see pi written somewhere, you come to me. What's your value? I say so and so, 3.142. You go back. Somewhere again, you see pi, again you come to me, what's the value? Again you come to me, 100 times I've used pi in the program, 100 times you come to me, what's the value, what's the value? The value is never changing, why are you asking me every time? Didn't I tell you last time it's 3.142? You should have used that. That means if something is never going to change, why waste time going to a memory every time and finding out what its value? Instead, if you define it as a constant, so here is the answer, if you define it as a constant, Wherever you've written pi in the program, in this program only once, but suppose it's a program that finds area, this is a periphery, the circumference, uh, the volume of a sphere and various geometric calculations. I have pi written at various places. Everywhere, the compiler, when it compiles this program, will directly substitute 3.142 at all those places. At the time of compilation, 3.142 is substituted. So when the program goes to the processor, there is no pi. It's actually 3.142 written everywhere. Are you understanding? So the processor doesn't have to go to the memory every time to check the value. For a variable, it has to because for a variable, the value may be something here, the value may be something else over here and something else over here. So every time a variable is encountered, a trip to the memory is necessary. But if it's a constant, then why waste time doing those trips? The constant should be embedded in the program. And that is why you define it. These are called macros. This definition is called a macro definition, not giving you complex words for no reason. Basically, it's a constant. So when you define a constant, this is the advantage. It's auto substituted all through the program at the time of compilation, making the execution much faster. Are you clear? So that's your that's why you have a definition section. You may not just define just a constant, you can define a macro also, but like I said, that will happen later. I don't want to bombard you with too much information and so that you get disconnected. In this answer and from the scope of a beginning section where you're learning, see, this is what you do in the definition section. Uh, global declarations. So these are variables, all right? Radius and area are variables. Radius we'll take from the user, area we'll calculate as pi r squared, okay? Float is the data type. I'm sure if you are looking at this video, you have seen a statement like this in your life. Int radius area. It could have been integers also, but if it's integers, I will never get a fractional part. And because pi is a fraction, there will be fraction in the answer. So I would rather use a float. Are you clear? So float means floating point. That means it can hold a fraction. Now, this is the space where you define global variables. Listen carefully. Had I written the same statement over here, which I can, had I written it over here, then it's a local variable which is available only to the body of the function where it is declared. So if I had another function, those variables would not be accessible to that function. But if you define it above main in this area, it is available to every function of your program. Hence, it is called global declaration. Are you clear? So this is the global space where you can declare something which will be available to all the functions and sub functions and everything in your program. Everybody can use this. Now, this is your main program. A main program is a function where you write your instructions. Let's run through the instructions. They're very simple. Printf, I'm printing C Bharat Acharya. That will be the title. This will be your output screen. There'll be a line below it and the title of the program, area of a circle. I have these habits. I like beautiful outputs. Uh, right from the first lecture of my whole course, I have taught you how to create wonderful outputs because what's the point of writing fabulous programs and making a shabby output UI, UI UX, you know the full forms, right? Yeah, the user interface and the user experience is a very critical part of selling any program today. You may have the best app to do something, but if it doesn't look appealing, if it doesn't have a correct interface where you can reach your target points by just the least number of clicks, it won't work. It's just no longer. Today's world is a graphic world. Long time ago, in the third, fourth generation of computers, there was DOS. Uh, I don't know whether you ever worked on DOS. Uh, black screen, just writing commands. Mm. I have worked. We started learning computers at 
in mid 80s so yeah that was what was running at that time dos lotus dbase cobol i've learned all those languages it was just too attracted to computers right from an early age anyway anyway so coming back in that there was a plain screen no colors just one color of uh, whatever text no font crazy fonts and things like that and then started to get improved but today it's all graphic and it's all very beautiful so your graphic uh, presentation of your program is just as important and that's what I teach students right from the first lecture that your output should look wonderful. This is how the output of this program is going to look. I'm just going to press a key but before that just to show you what's going to happen. So after area of a circle I've left two lines you can see backslash and backslash and so there's a line drop so that you have that whole title separate and then your main body of the program where I'm showing radius equal to and then there's a space where the user will enter. Type out the radius. We will calculate the area as pi r square. You understood this right? printf radius can f accept radius and it's a floating point number so percentage f because you are accepting a floating point number it will be stored in radius and means stored the information at the address of radius and means at the address of so area is equal to pi r square so pi into r into r printf area is equal to and again i have written this area and then i have dropped two lines so that my output is separated from my final cursor that's shown and this point 0.3 means I want the output to have three floating point, three digits after the point, nothing more than that. I don't want a full length of uh, accuracy. Nobody needs that. Three digits is fine. You may have four, you may have five. That is your choice. Your program, you decide. Three is acceptable by most, so I've kept it as three. Now, this is how the output of the program looks like. And if this brings a smile on your face, just by seeing my output, Imagine the pleasure you get when this is the output of your program and this my friend is the simplest program We do very complex programs and you have to do that's how you grow as a programmer You practice various things going up to making linked lists making structures 2d arrays matrices multiplying them At all points of time you have to have immaculate control over your output the presentation output Which is not what you learn at that time at that time you'll be focusing on those complex ideas in the beginning, when you start learning programming, you get full control of how you want to present your output. So this is how the output looks like. Your title, see Bharat Acharya, the underline, the, the title of the program, the radius, area, etc. And that's besides the point. So this is your main function. That's also your program. Now, apart from main function, you can create your own functions. Declare them at the top in the global area and write the whole body of the function down or just simply write the whole body of the function above main. There are two styles, you may do it the way you want. Any function can be created by you. Whatever function you create, you give it the name. If you create a function for simple interest, you can call it simple or simple int and then define it as simple int is equal to p into n into r upon 100. You know what that is, right? Or for permutations or for factorials, you can create whatever functions you want and give it the name the way you like execute that function you got to call the function by writing the name of function like these are also function calls printf and scanf are function calls these are not your functions these are predefined functions which you have included in your standard input output file because you didn't hash include stdio.h you are allowed to call these functions anyway my point is i'm going to ask you something very interesting and this is going to open up your whole idea about uh, your first c program I just said you can create any function you want and give it any name you want. Correct. Keep this in mind. Secondly, any function you created will never execute unless you called it. If I didn't write printf, there won't be a printf. You won't do some, print out something on the screen till the time I don't write printf. So the two things that I said is A, a function can have any name we want. B, a function has to be called. Correct. Both of these don't apply to main. Can you see that? Main, look there, yes main is also a function did you call main but it got executed can you change the name of main have you ever asked your teacher you're in the middle of your semester you've done five six seven ten fifteen turns in the lab your teacher has told you main program is called main did you ask the teacher why main can i call it mainly or my main or mains or anything else mvb <laughs> no did you ask but so whose fault is that don't leave it all for the teacher to pour out the information there is the onus on you too as a student you say so and so teacher is good so and so teacher is very good how good a student are you 
when somebody tells you this you if you didn't even feel like asking that to the teacher there is a lack of curiosity or there is curiosity but you're still suppressing it because you have other priorities which is not what the best student would want to do anyway you cannot change the name of main because you don't call main but it still executes because it is automatically called by the processor the c compiler the c processor the c program is wired its program to call a function by the name main every time it runs there is an internal automatic call to a function by the name main are you clear main nothing else main so your program has to have a main if there is no main your program will not work are you clear not even main one it has to have the name main are you clear every other function you create you give it the name you want you call it wherever you want this function is automatically called by the assembler or the compiler uh, i said assembler because the same concept applies to assembly programs but basically it's called automatically and that is why its name has to be fixed because you're not calling it the system is calling it are you clear so the system calls main that is how control comes here and now control is in your hands you do what you want are you clear it's like your computer your phone starts the operating system you don't start it the phone starts it by default puts all the apps on the screen gives you control now you decide which app you want to run but the operating system is not invoked by you that is automatically invoked invoked by your phone or your computer similar idea anyway so you can't change the name of main but you can change the name of any other function so any other function could would be declared just like main and could have any name and can be invoked by writing the name of the function that's it this is the body of a c program hope you understood it now let's go ahead so that was a question one all theory question two fabulous theory question differentiate between primary memory and secondary memory primary memory is ram and rom secondary memory is hard disk floppy cd dvd you know this no you know it now great now pay attention here why do you know there's a ram in your computer hmm you uh, what is the size of your ram what is the size of your ram they will ask you this abruptly in an interview you can't answer this come on come on a computer store vendor the, the assistant over there can answer not degrading anybody i'm just saying someone who is not an engineer is just a sales person can answer this instantly come on how do you not know how much ram do you have yeah 4 gb bare minimum for a computer run today bare minimum 8 gb most likely is what you would be having 12 gb 16 gb if you are like good computers more than that if you are a pro gamer anyway or do you like to do a lot of video editing or things like that uh anyway so that's the size of ram you have a little bit of rom you don't know the size of your rom i wouldn't mind that very very few people even know that there is rom in the system you know the difference between ram and rom right ram is writable rom is read only memory it's fixed so you have a few mb of rom anyway mb a few mb not gigabytes or whatever hard disk the size is about 1 tb normally what we all have you may have 2 tb 3 tb don't say that in an interview then they ask you what are you storing in that and in fact today it's also irrelevant to have so much hard disk when everything is stored in the cloud you don't even need that much anyway floppy outdated so you won't know it's 1.44 mb we used to carry floppies in our pockets when we were college student that was the in thing and that was the only way we could transfer information there were no pen drives in that year <sighs> innocent days anyway uh, but the imagine size what can you store 1.4 mb today you can't even store one image in that size <laughs> all good quality image anyway CDs and DVDs, 700 MB, uh, 4.7 uh, GB. Anyway, so this is primary memory. This is secondary memory. Now, the question is, why do you need so many memories? I asked this question when I was in first year in your position. When these memories were introduced to me, I asked the teacher, "What's the purpose? Why you have so many memories? Why can't we just have one hard disk and finish the whole thing, or just let's have only RAM? Every memory has a role to play." I have a very detailed video of this called Introduction of Microprocessors, where I have gone to full length. I am not going to go to that detail because this subject is not about that. So I am going to keep it short and simple for you to just basically understand what is primary and secondary memory because you ought to know it. Okay, not just bookish knowledge. There has to be a lot of general common sense about computers which you need to know. You should sound when you talk to people. You should sound like someone who is doing engineering, not someone who just. happens to do engineering all right difference anyway so uh, this is your processor your um, intel or apple m1 or snapdragon or whatever processor you have this is your primary memory that talks directly to the processor 
which contains RAM and ROM. 4 GB I've taken as the minimum size would be 8 GB, 12 GB like I just said. ROM is just a few MB, 1, 2, 3, 4. You know the difference between MB and GB, right? A thousand kilo makes a mega, not exactly thousand, it's one zero two four, I'm keeping it simple. So thousand kilo makes a mega, thousand mega makes a giga, thousand giga makes a tera. So it's all multiples of thousands. The Indian counting system is obsessed with uh, hundreds. So we go units, tens, hundreds, thousands, 10,000 and a lakh. So our lakh happens at 100,000 and then 10 lakh in crore. So crore happens at 100 lakh. So we are about 100. We may change the denomination at 100, but the international counting system changes the denomination at thousands. So it's units, tens, hundreds, thousands. So that's your 1,000 and 10,000, 100,000, no lakh, 100,000. And then a million. So a thousand thousand makes a million. Again, you got 1 million. 10 million, 100 million, 1000 million, 1000 million becomes a billion, 10 billion, uh, 100 billion, 1000 billion becomes a trillion. So on every 1000 you change the denomination. So that's kilo, mega, giga, tera, 1000 million, billion, trillion. All right. So basically on every 1000 you shift to the next, keeping it simple. So this is just a few MB and this is a few GB. So this is 1000 times bigger than this. So basically when somebody says primary memory, it basically means RAM. There is ROM. I'm not saying it's not. But it's a thousand of the whole space. If this whole body of mine is primary memory, this is uh, wrong. Are you clear? Anyway, very less. <laughs> coming back, coming back. So, uh, though that negligible ROM is very useful, but it's very small in size. Main primary memory is RAM. So, this was primary memory. To be honest, this was the memory that was used by the initial processors. Secondary memory is invented for having more storage capacity. Hard disk, ridiculously big. Look at the size, terabyte, and not just one. I'm sure you, many of you all have two, maybe some of you all even have three. Still one itself is so big, this is four GB, that's 250 times that to make one TB. Do you understand? 200, not twice or thrice, 250 times. So basically all this is negligible as compared to the size of the hard disk. Floppy today is obsolete. Back in the day, we used to be 1.4 for MB. Floppy CD, DVD are not to increase the storage capacity. They are basically for portability. If I want some information from you, during our days, you used to put a floppy inside and get it. Then our uh, next generation, or not even next, during our own growing up days, it used to be a CD and get like 100 songs together. Then put a DVD and then get all your music in one DVD or get movies into a DVD and things like that. Then came Blu-ray discs. I have a whole collection. What's the point today? So you get better, better streaming online. Okay, anyway, anyway, but anyway, was, we moved through technologies. So coming back, these are for portability. So you understand their purpose. Immediately you understand their purpose. I want something from your computer. I'm not going to carry your hard disk home. I need a medium to transfer information. So their purpose ends at portability. Hard disk is used for background storage to store all those songs, movies and programs and all those apps. What you have in your computer to store all that is your hard disk. Then what is RAM used for? What is the difference? Why have these two levels? Hard disk, floppy, CD, DVD, they are all disk memories. They have data stored in circular tracks, all right? Which means they have to be rotated to get the data or to write data, to read or write data, or transfer data, they have to be rotated. That means the speed at which they operate depends upon the speed of rotation, which means there is physical aspect involved, physics involved. It's not pure electronics. And this can never match the speed of raw electronics. RAM and ROM are semiconductor chips. They are electronic chips. To transfer data, there is no physical movement. So their speeds are tremendously high as compared to the speeds of these devices. So they are very fast, not just very fast. This also reduces the amount of power you consume. To rotate anything physically, you consume a lot of power. So these hard disks and CD floppy, they had to be rotated. So there were motors, you understand, to do the rotation. And that is what was draining the power. That's why market leader Apple, I use a lot of Apple products because, not just because you're a fanboy or something, but because you understand the improvements and the guts they had when they took these steps. Uh, mid uh, 20 to 2000 to 2010, in that era they started releasing MacBooks without a physical hard disk, using solid state disks. You learn them, it's a different technology, it's basically flash ROM. Where there is no physical movement, because of that, 
in that era all laptops used to have two to three hours of battery life in fact today also still many windows laptops have two to three hours which is ridiculous before you even get seriously working the battery is drained so basically if you have a laptop you have to have a charger with you but when Mac started doing it boom straight eight hours ten hours it's amazing when it's when it first came out you'd be how can it work so long you are tired but it's still not tired it's still going on because it threw out those moving objects no cd drive no hard disk we don't need them let's come up with new technologies they are more expensive but it gives you a few things in internet i told you power consumption became a very important factor in selling out guys you may have the best phone today but if the battery drains in half a day the phone is of no use to you you got you got my point so all of these involve power consumption to a much higher level as compared to these. So their drawbacks consume a lot of power, slow, consumes less power, fast. Then why do you have a secondary memory? Why not just have RAM ROM and finish it? Because these are cheap. They are very, very cheap. RAM is semiconductor memory. So to create that memory, the process is very expensive. And what you need to do is create microscopic circuits which are create, created through laser electronics and blah, blah, uh, which you will learn in some or the other subject. Uh, the point is the end cost of these memories is much higher, which I will prove to you right now. You go to buy RAM today, 4 GB, 8 GB, 6 GB, 12 GB, whatever. Uh, the price range is about two, 3,000. Correct? I'm not selling, so there's no bargaining happening over here. I'm giving you a ballpark, two, 3,000. A hard disk is about four, 5,000. So basically in that same range, two, three, four, five, basically maybe double, but in that same thousand dollar range, but see the size difference. This is 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 GB. That is 1, 2, 3 TB. Do you understand? It's containing so much more information at such lower cost. Look at this. I'll show you again. A 4 GB RAM, you go, you write down, you finish this video, you search, you can search online to image, you'll get a cost. Uh, what? You'll get for 1000 rupees or something. A DVD in that set when you buy, you get it for 20 rupees. 20 rupees. It's still the same size, 4.7 GB. In fact, more than 4 GB. But it's for 20 rupees. Look, look at that. They're so cheap to store. So what do you want? May I ask you a simple question? What do you want in a computer? You want your computer to be expensive or cheap? Answer honestly. Honestly. You want it to be expensive or cheap? Cheap. You want it to be slow or fast? Fast. <laughs> so how do you get a fast and a cheap computer? Work on fast memory and store in cheap memory. Did you understand? This is your working memory. This is where the computer does all operations because this is super fast, but this cannot be used for storage because this is very expensive. So store everything in your secondary memory. That's the concept of primary and secondary memory. Secondary memory is like a bag. Primary memory is your desk. All your books are stored in your bag. The book that you want to work on comes onto your desk. You do your operation, put a bag in your bag. Are you clear? So all your songs, movies, etc., 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 everything is stored in your C drive, D drive. They're all partitions of your hard disk. So all of that is here. You double click on any program. It comes into the primary memory. The information comes into the primary memory. Processor does all the work and then the program is sent back and so on. As you open more and more programs, more and more information comes into your RAM. Do you understand after some point there will be a fight for space? That is when your computer starts becoming slow, which is your practical experience. You open one window, your computer is fast. Two windows, fine. Three windows, fine. When you're shopping, you open 10, 15 sites and suddenly you start seeing everything is moving very slowly. Why? Because all of that information can no longer remain in, in the RAM. So every time you move from one window to the other window, all the information which was sent back has to be brought back and that back and forth and that fighting and the shifting of information is what makes the computer slow. What is the solution to it? A. Use the computer diligently. Don't open 20 windows at a time. Be smart. B. If you still want to do that, you want to behave like a brat, buy more RAM. Anybody with this much knowledge of computers will tell you more the RAM, faster the computer. You got the answer now. Why? Because everything comes into the RAM to do operations. So I think you got the picture. I have explained all this much more in detail in a separate video, which, which is more about microprocessors. So you need to know much more. But as a 
store of learning programming this is what you need to understand that all your work happens in your ram when we are discussing program we discuss a lot about ram so you need to know what is that but your program is stored in the hard disk what you bring in comes into the ram are you clear all the hash improved files come into the ram but they are not just stdi on corner there are various other uh, header files which are all stored in the hard disk only when you include them they'll come into the ram are you clear now why do we have rom i'm going to keep it very short and simple though it's a very big answer it's a whole subject but i'm going to keep it short and simple you need rom because rom is non volatile say it again what non volatile which means when you switch off the power supply the information is not lost ram is empty when you switch it on again it contains garbage but rom holds the information even if you switched off the computer packed it and put it inside your cupboard and get it back after your vacation or for after however long the information is still there that's called non volatile the information doesn't evaporate okay why do we need such permanent information you know your computer or your phone has an operating system right your computer most likely windows or mac whatever you're using so generally students use windows even when students ask me i also recommend windows because a lot of things work better on windows at a student level at a professional level no there's no comparison uh but anyway uh, so uh what about operating system you have you know your computer has an operating system that's the first program that runs when your computer starts and it is absolutely important controls the whole system where is your operating system stored this is a question i ask in mock interviews i conduct i conduct interviews not like actual placement interviews but the mock interviews which uh, for various academies so this is a question i like to ask and uh, getting a wrong answer in this shows how weak is the subject knowledge of that student you may have by hearted your theory answers and got your marks but that only helps you reach the placement table you reach the table on the basis of your marks but you get the job on the basis of your knowledge all right even if you may manage to get the job you progress ahead on the basis of your knowledge a lot of things were taken for granted uh, the year the seniors who are two a few years older to you got away with a lot of things because uh, they, they the whole general uh, level of information was much lower but with every year more and more people are becoming more and more aware there is a lot of education available at various places so the crop that's coming out every year is getting better and better and now if you don't know your fundamentals you will clearly stand out so coming back where is your operating system stored in your rom are a question impossible i told you rom is a few mb how can an operating system be a few mb operating system is the biggest program of your computer my own app is uh, 11 mb how <laughs> it won't fit in rom my own app so how can the operating system fit in that anyway so operating system is stored in your hard disk if you're using windows you can even see it uh, go to uh, uh, c drive you see the list of all your folders right at the bottom you will see windows that is where it's clearly visible anyway so when your computer starts the operating system has to run what did i say every program can only run from the primary memory nothing can run from the secondary memory that means when your computer starts the operating system has to be brought into the primary memory it won't fly and come it won't dream and come it won't self realize there is no magic in computers everything is done by a program get this clear drill it inside your head everything that a computer does is by a program that means if your operating system has to come into the ram there has to be a program that loads it that is called the booting program BIOS that program is stored in the ROM. Are you clear? When your computer starts, the first thing that runs is the BIOS program from the ROM. Can it be stored in the RAM? No, because RAM is volatile. Can it be stored in the secondary memory? No, because then it won't execute. Then to get it, it will need another program. So it is stored in ROM. That is the whole purpose of this tiny ROM in a computer. That's all. It stores the BIOS. So when the computer starts, it goes to the ROM. The BIOS runs. The BIOS brings the operating system into the RAM. Then the operating system starts running and takes over the whole computer, prepares all the internal things which you learn over your four years of engineering, which is very interesting how a computer works. to create the next generation you have to know the current generation very well anyway and then once everything is set that's when all your icons come your wallpaper comes your clock starts everything is there and now control is given in your hand now you can run whatever program you want are you clear so i hope you understood the concept of primary and secondary memory yeah this is faster primary memory is faster but it's more expensive and used for current task all your current operations happen over here secondary memory is used for background storage it's cheaper and all the points opposite all right i could have simply given this distinguish and like you know how everybody 
this is how this is how <laughs> i don't want to do that i wanted you to understand once you understood it take a screenshot you will uh, understand all these points it's ram rom this is faster this is expensive use for current operations uh, mainly electronic primary memory is mainly electronic there's no question of a hard disk or something doing the job of a ram ram has to be and rom has to be semiconductor so that they are super fast it's accessed directly by the processor hard, uh, secondary memory is accessed indirectly we never directly work on the secondary memory Primary memory is on the motherboard. When you open the motherboard, you see RAM ROM inside. Uh, secondary memory is connected to the motherboard. Hard disk, floppy CD, they are all connected by connecting cables. You will see those big fat cables, which are all becoming smaller and smaller. With better engineering. Uh, primary memory can certainly not be portable. I can't take your RAM out and go. With your RAM working, of course, to repair it, I'll take. But with a working computer, I'm not going to pull it out. But your CD, DVD, you transfer information and pull it out. Anyway, so that was your basic differentiation between primary and secondary memory. Now let's get into our first real programming question. Come on. List and explain the logic operators. And why they call it logical? Everything is logical. Logic operators. Anyway, could have to use the better choice of words. But superb question paper so i won't i won't really mind uh explain logic operators of uh, c programming and analyze the following program so we'll analyze the program first let's understand the logic operators what are logic operators and listen carefully uh, for a, you, many of you who are watching this video would be in second year third year or fourth year engineering because from my experience i've seen people don't really focus too much on programming in the early years which is sad uh so yeah then if you're in second year, third year, you know, AND gate, OR gate, you've done all those circuits and you know that. But for you, if you're a first year engineering student, which most of y'all would be, pay attention. I'm going to make it very simple and tell you what is an AND gate. Then we'll go to OR and then we'll go to a NOT. These three are the fundamental building blocks of electronics. When you learn this beautiful subject of COA, you will understand. I'm just going to take one minute of yours. You'll understand. All powerful, uh, you'll build an ALU, so you know ALU, right? Arithmetic logic unit where all the processing happens. All powerful mathematical operations like square root, log, cos, tan, factorial, they're all basically a set of multiply and divide. You agree? All integration, derivation, derivation whatever you do, eventually is a set of multiplications and divisions. Multiply and divide are a set of additions and subtractions. Okay? Correct? Multiply is repeated, add division is repeated, subtract, and then the algorithm is making them faster. But basically, it boils down to addition subtraction. Subtraction is nothing else but addition of two's complement, which is what you'll understand in a separate subject, not this subject, but just hear me. Subtraction is also basically done by addition. So finally, all the arithmetic, all the processing in the world boils down to an adder circuit. An addition circuit, an adder circuit is created using AND gate, OR gate and a NOT gate. So this is the holy grail of processing. An AND gate, an OR gate, and a NOT gate. Are you clear that DNA of everything that happens in a computer finally boils down to these three gates? So what is a gate? A gate accepts two inputs and produces an output. Are you clear? It's not like taking two wires, chipping the plastic part, joining them with the cello tape and moving it ahead. No. That is an electrical circuit. In elect electrical circuit, you're just passing current. In an electronic circuit, you're passing current, which can have either logic zero or logic one. So to create that idea, the logic, whether two lines being zero, zero should give you a zero or zero, zero should give you a one, etc. What happens when these two lines are two different values? What will be the output? To create that logic, you need a gate. Hence the name logic gates. So the first logic gate is a logic and it is written as two ands. So A double and B means a logical and. Expression 1 and expression 2, the result will be either 1 or 0. 1 is true, 0 is false. It's easy, it's easy, it's much easier than I'm making it sound. Just pay attention. Here, use the visual uh, more than what you're hearing. The visual is really, really simple. Look here, this is an AND gate. So, these are the two inputs. Expression 1, expression 2 means the two inputs. What did I say? The two inputs coincide. The gate decides what will be the output if the inputs are 0, 0 or 0, 1 or 1, 0 or 1, 1. In all cases, current will flow, but whether it will carry logic 0 or logic 1, that is what the gate decides. AND gate decides it differently, OR gate decides it differently. First, we are talking about AND gate. AND gate will give you a 1 only if this is 1 and this is 1. So simple. That's AND gate. 
Hence the name and. See, I told you it's very simple. The beginning, the, to get you to that point, it takes a lot of effort. Once you're there, it's very simple. An AND gate, that's all. It gives a 1 when both the inputs are 1. If this condition is true, 1 means true, 0 means false. So if this condition is true and this condition is true, only then the answer will be 1. Otherwise, the answer in all other cases, if both of them are false, answer is false. If any one condition is false, if anything is zero, people say this is multiplication. Please don't use those silly, trivial methods of understanding. Apply your mind and once for all put this effort, you will use these gates all through the four years, eight semesters of engineering. So once understand the gate. An AND gate gives you a one only when both inputs are one. Hence the name AND. It's so simple. This should be one AND. This should be 1 for the answer to be 1. If any of them is 0 or both of them are 0, the answer will be 0. Are you clear? So result is 1. That is true. Only if both conditions are true. True means 1. Only if both of them are 1, the answer will be 1. Are you clear? So look at this as a statement, as an example, because the question says with example. So you would write some example. If A is equal to. So when you write an if and you want to say is equal to, you put a double equal to. All right. You know that, right? If you didn't, you know it now. So if A is equal to 5 and B is equal to 7, only then C will be 1. Are you clear? So C will become 1 when both of these conditions are satisfied. You're doing a loop. You want to break the loop when the count is 5. So if count is equal to 5 and your some particular job is done, if it's not done, you still want to continue. So if count is equal to 5 and so and so is equal to so and so, you can put any condition, you can put any number of conditions, but as a beginning programmer, you'll put 2. So if this condition and this condition are satisfied, the answer, whatever you write over here, will take place. Are you clear? So C will become 1 only if A is 5 and B is 7. Are you clear? So that's your logical and it is written with two ampersands. This is called an ampersand, basically an and symbol. So it's written with two ands. This is how you write it. Are you clear? I'm going to show you with a programming example first. Let's see the theory. Then we will dive into a VS code and I will show you this in a program. Don't worry at all. Excuse me. We've just been talking. Oh, it's been more than not. <laughs> no problem. Logic or. Uh, it's written, it's written as two vertical lines, vertical, so you don't call it a slash, it's called a pipe, but whatever. So it is uh, above your enter key. You will see it, your left curly bracket, right curly bracket, the next key. If you have a keyboard in front of you, you can see it if you're watching on the computer. If you're watching on the phone right now, don't fiddle with it. Basically that vertical line, all right, which you can see over here also separated between the subjects. So it's that same thing. So put them twice, that is called a logical or. So expression one, expression two. Now. Come on, look here, look here, look here. And gate, look here. And gate gives a 1 when first condition and second condition, both have to be 1. Or gate will give a 1 when this or this or anybody is 1. If anything is satisfied, I am happy. And gate says everything should be satisfied. Or gate says anything is satisfied, I am okay. Both are false answer is 0. Anyone is 1, answer is 1. Anyone is 1, answer is 1. Both are 1, great, answer is still 1. Are you understanding? So you use OR when, suppose you are do, doing a loop 5 times, so when the count is 5, OR, you don't have to always do it 5 times. Maybe at the third count itself, if some other condition is satisfied. So if the count is 5, so you will stop. Or if some condition is satisfied, if any of these two are satisfied, your loop is over. I'm just giving an example, basically. So if A is equal to 5 or B is 7, C will be 1. So in this case, C will be 1 when A is 5, 5 or B is 7. In the previous case, C will be 1 when A is 5 as well as B is 7. Tell me, did you understand this? So and and it, it's not that big. It's obvious. And enforces the condition that both have to be satisfied. Or says, if anything is satisfied, I'm okay with it. Are you clear? The more lenient gate. Or so it may sound. When you learn more electronics, you'll understand what OR gate does. It's so crucial in memory designing that designing the whole motherboard. Anyway, it happens in different subjects. Here you're looking at it as a programmer's perspective. And the third one, the inverter, also called the NOT gate. NOT gate means not so and so. So the opposite of true. So opposite of true is false. Opposite of false is true. 
opposite of one is zero, opposite of zero is one. So if it's zero, it will give you a not will give you a one. So it basically is an inverter. Are you clear? It converts your logic one into logic zero and basically converts the logic zero into a logic one. It just inverts the input as simple as that. Inverts the expression. If true becomes false, if false becomes true. If A is, I didn't say equal to five. I said if A is not equal to five, then C will be one. So C will be one when A is not equal to five. Please tell me, did you understand this? So AND gate, say AND gate has two inputs and gives you one output. OR gate has two inputs and gives you one output. NOT gate has just one input, it just inverts the input and gives you the output. That means a one becomes a zero, a true becomes a false, a false becomes a true. Are you clear? That's it. Those are the logic operations. And now, let's see this. Come on. I have not written the final output that you have to answer. Uh, because there is printf, there is a standard input output.h is included. Now, 7 and 0. So, what you write in quotes is not processed, is just displayed. So, 7 and 0 is equal to does this. It displays this much. This percentage D means it's a placeholder. This is where a value will come. What value will come? This. The result of this expression will be embedded over here. So, at the output, this much part, 7 and 0 is here already. What you put in quotes simply is produced out. So, 7 space and space 0 space is equal to 7 space and space 0 space is equal to is already there. Did you understand? It's already there because it is there in the quotation. So, it simply comes out. This placeholder that you see over here, at that place, something will come over here. What will come? The result of this expression. Now look at this expression. 7 and 0. Anything and 0. In an AND gate, if one input is 0, the answer is, come on my friend, the answer is 0. AND gate will give you a 1 only when both inputs are 1. Are you clear? The moment anything is 0, the answer is 0. So the output of this is 7 and 7. 7 and 0 will give you a 0. That means over here you get a 0. Are you clear? This was just a comment. This is the output screen. So you get a 0. Are you understanding it? That 0, 7 and 0 will give you a 0. That 0 will be substituted over here. The backslash n means you will drop a line. That's irrelevant. I'm just telling you. Understood? Next one. Answer. Answer. Before I go to the second one, third one is so very simple that you can understand. Not 0 is equal to not 0. What is not 0? 1. Opposite of 2 is false. Opposite of false is true. So output that the output of third one is 1. That is just a cakewalk that you can understand easily. 7 or 0 is equal to 7 or 0. This statement will be here. Equal to will be here. This percentage D is a placeholder. It's telling the result of this expression will come over here. What is the result of this expression? 7 or 0. In an OR gate, if anything is 1, the answer is 1. Remember, the output of these gates can only be 1 or 0. Can only be 1 or 0. So, if I had written 0 or 0, the answer would be 0. But if there is any non-zero value over here, the answer will be 1. Not 7. Not 7. The answer will be 1. Are you clear? That's what I said. Don't look at OR as addition. It's not addition. Understand the concept. 7 is 0, 1, 1, 1. Basically, there is a set of 1s. 0 is 0, 0, 0, 0. So, all sets are zeros. I am doing an OR. What is the result? Anything odd with 0 will be 1 if the thing is not 0. If, if I am not doing 0 or 0, OR gate, OR gate will give you a 0 only when both inputs are 0. Otherwise, in all cases, OR gate gives you a 1. So that means because both inputs are not 0, one input over here is a non-zero input, the answer will be 1. Tell me, did you understand? AND gate will give you a 0 because the moment you see a 0 somewhere, it ends it with 0, you get your answer as 0. In OR gate, this 0 is irrelevant. Both of them should be 0 for the answer to be 0. Both of them are not 0, so the answer is 1. Understood? And the last one, not 0. Not 0 is definitely 1. Let me show it to you over here. Um, this was, remember the program that we discussed? Uh, the, uh, the first program where I showed you the structure of a C program. Let's run this. I'll show you the output. Uh, area of a circle, let's say the radius is 6 and your area is whatever is 6 into pi into r into r. So, 3.142 into 6 into 6 is what you get over here. You can verify it with the calculator. This is my, uh, what do you call it, command prompt. 
like I said, I like good outputs. People have that ridiculous command prompts, which you can so easily tame and control. You've got to control your own output screen. This is your screen. This just shows how shabby your table is. <laughs> if you know how to keep things clean, you will keep your outputs also clean and as you will keep with your program. Now, uh, I don't want to sit and type that question because then it will just be spending too much time. When I teach the programming subject in all my 30 videos, every program I've typed because there you're dealing with one program in a whole lecture. Here, because there's so much, I am, I've already pre-typed and kept it so that we save each other's time. The one that we are looking at is logic operations. So there you go. Let me remove this. Yeah. So logic operation is the same question. 7 and 0, 7 or 0 and not, let's keep it, not 0. Not 0, right? So let's run this. What was our presumptive output? 7 and 0 should give you a 0. 7 or 0 should give you a 1 and not 0 should give you a 1. So your output should be 0, 1, 1 basically. Let's run this and see. 0, 1, 1. Can you see that? So uh, let's play with this. Let's play with this. Instead of 7 and 0, suppose I write 7 and 1. Now you answer. Okay. What should be the output of 7 and 1? Please answer. This is a non-zero input. This is a non-zero input. In an AND gate, both of them are non-zero. That means the answer should be, it's an AND gate. Answer should be 1. Let's run this. The first input output has now become 1. Did you understand? Now let's change this 7 to 0. Let's play because in your exam it won't be the exact same question. It will be something around it. So let's play with it. 0 and 1. Now by now you should be able to answer 0 and anything. The result has to be 0. The result is 0. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. 0 and 0. Yeah, let's play. Let's programming. You can't be scared of it. It's fun. Once you get your handle on it, it's fun. Those who get hooked on to programming, you'll see it. You write down first here. Your journey, you'll see it. There'll be a certain set of people who will always be there in the computer lab. will be writing the best programs in the class. Once you get hooked on to it, it is addictive in, in the good way. And will land you that best job that comes, that job that is five times, six times the salary of the other jobs. It will land you that if you are in that position. And to get to that, like I said, it won't happen in one day or in one week before the placement. It's a journey. Start right. Anyway, so zero and zero has to give you a zero. All right. Now, I'm coming, uh, keeping it back to what it was earlier. All right. Now, or. 7 or 0. This was the question. So basically this is a non-zero number and this is 0. So the answer is 1. So focus on the second result. I'm just removing the first result now so that we don't have distraction. 7 or 0 is 1. Can you see that? Now let's say what if I do 6 or 0. Come on, come on, come on, come on. 6 or 0. What should it be? It should still be 1. Only 0 or 0 can give us 0. Let's see, let's see. 6 or 0 is still 1. You understand? Let's do 0 or 0. What do you think the answer is going to be? Screen. Yeah. Come on. You got a zero. Are you clear? So are you now getting a handle on these logic operations? And now, not zero. <laughs> not zero. Not zero has to be one. It is one. Not one has to be not one has to be zero. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Not one is zero. Are you clear? So coming back, so that was the result of your program. And now the last question for this video, I've broken down the whole uh, uh, set of uh, 10 questions into five videos, module one, module two, module three, because otherwise it will just be too long a video. Uh, and I don't want to do it just for the sake of doing it. I want you to enjoy it and master what you're learning. So don't even try to watch all five together unless you have the exam the next day. Don't be in that stage. Don't learn it on the last day. If you're doing it, then do it with all the seriousness. But otherwise, give your time, self time to prepare. These are wonderful subjects that will shape your whole engineering in the future. That your whole remaining four years, three years, and plus your whole entire future after that. Focus on these. Yeah, you take applied physics lightly. You take applied chem lightly. You take uh, engineering drawing lightly. Yeah, I won't mind that because may, most of those will not make a difference to most of your careers for the rest of your engineering. But this, you're smart enough. 
Okay, data types. So C has various data types. There are advanced data types like arrays, structures and all. That's not what the question says. The question says basic data types. All right. If you, you may just, if you are a show of kind, you may still write at the end of the answer there are advanced data types like this, but don't explain them. Because you explain them, that means you don't know what are basic data types. So basic data types is integer, character and float. Now in integer, you have basic int, which is what we use most of the times. There is short int if you want to save space, if you know your numbers are small, like if you're talking about uh, short int is always two bytes. Two bytes means it can have 252 two bytes. One byte is uh, uh, eight bits. Two bytes is 16 bits, so it can have a value of 2 raised to 16. That is 64,000. So if you know your number is value is not going to go more than 64,000, a short end does the job. You don't need to memorize ranges. Okay, you can figure it out as a power of 2. A single bit can have two values, 0 or 1. Two bits can have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Four values. That means 2 raised to 2. Three bits can have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. That means eight values. That means two raised to three. Four bits will have two raised to four values. Five bits will have two raised to five values. That is 32. Six bits will have two raised to six values. That is 64. And so on. Which again, I know very well because I teach various other subjects related to that. I, I, I work, eat, sleep, drink computers. But you don't. And you don't need to memorize these numbers. A simple calculator will tell you two raised to anything that you want. So a short end, which is two bytes, which is 16 bits, has a range of two raised to 16, which is 64,000, 65536 to be exact. I see I'm being a show off now. So if you know that your result is going to be up to 64,000, you don't need a bigger integer than that. So a normal int is not needed. You can work with short end. Now this is very good optimization habit. If you get into it, at least you know it, that's great. From practical programming at college level, most of the time we stick to int. Int also in the original uh, implementation of C was just two bytes, but then over the years, as 70s get into 80s, got into 90s, got into this millennium, the world changed and became so powerful in programming, they realized two bytes is too small. So they changed the normal int to four bytes. That's why I ran two or four. In the initial implementation, it used to be two. It's two or four. Short int is always two. And then long int, which earlier was four, is now eight bytes. Eight bytes means 64 bits. So it has a range of. 2 raised to 64. Are you clear? 2 raised to 6. You can simply write 2 raised to 64. You don't really need to write the whole expanded number. No examiner is really that silly that he or she wants that number. A concept of 2 raised to 16 gives that answer. Are you clear? If your college teacher still wants the number, then memorize it. I mean, it's sad. Or do you don't, not, not even memorize it? Get it from the calculator. Make your, you don't use your phone. Yeah, your, your scientific calculator. Yeah, use your scientific calculator. It'll give you that full answer. Anyway, let's move ahead. They can be either signed or unsigned. Now, this is what I want you to know as a budding programmer, as a programmer of the future. Pay attention. When you declare an integer, you don't say anything. By default, it is signed. That means it can hold positive and negative values. If you want to specify clearly whether it is signed or unsigned, you can use the word as signed integer or unsigned integer. Signed means the name gives the answer. It is signed. That means it has a sign. That means it can either be positive or negative. Like how? Fifth standard. Till fourth standard, we thought the world is only from zero onwards. In fifth grade, we realized zero onwards. This side also there's a world and this side also there's a world. You got my point. So uh, signed numbers are numbers which work on both sides of zero. Unsigned numbers work are numbers which are only positive. So they don't have a sign. What kind of numbers should you use? Yeah, students say, sir, I will use signed always. Why? Because signed means I have the option of being positive or negative. Unsigned means I'm restricting myself to be only positive. So I'd rather use signed everywhere. Well, um, on initial thought, that seems right, but it's not really a correct approach. Uh, you're making a cricket app, okay? The sport that we all, or most of us love. Uh, not necessarily love wasting time on, okay? That, that it's ridiculous how you have those 60 days of cricket and you see the whole generation just watching matches all the Come on. Last five hours does the job. Anyway, not changing anyone's uh, love for the sport. I'm just telling. It is, as a teacher, you feel like, oh, this is criminal wastage of time. Anyway, coming back. So you're making an app for cricket, all right? Uh, every batsman score has to be positive. No matter how is, who is the batsman and what is the batsman, now what is the form, cannot be negative. So over there, if you follow the approach of always using signed numbers, which you just said sometime back, signed is better because it has the option of positive and negative. 
you are sacrificing your range. An 8-bit number can have 2 raised to 8, that is 256 values. So 256 options. Let's keep it simple. A 3-bit number can have 8 options. Correct? 8 options are 0 to 7. Now when you say 0 to 7, you're going only positive. That means in unsigned system, you have 8 options, 0 to 7. But in signed system, if you're in signed system, where you can have positive as well as negative numbers, your 8 options get divided on both sides of 0. So it's not really 0 to 7. It's 4 positive and 4 negative. To be exact, it's 0 to 3 and minus 1 to minus 4. But keeping it simple, 4 positive and 4 negative. So do you understand your capacity, which was to express 8 values on the positive side, has come down to 4 because you want the option to even go negative. Now that option should be used when you are working with numbers that can go negative. If you're making a cricket app and you know every batsman can only have a positive score, the number of boundaries hit can only be positive, the number of overs bowled can only be positive, the number of wickets taken can only be positive. For such variables, if you define them as signed, you are compromising their space. A batsman who could have scored more than 250 runs, you're making telling the batsman, no, after 128, please don't score anymore because I don't have the space to hold your number. To get that number, I'll need a bigger variable. Bigger variable means more memory, more time to transfer data, more time to update the score. The neighboring app, the competitive app gets updated faster than your app. Your app will not work. It won't sell. We all want the app that gets updated the fastest. You are seeing quick buzz or whatever as the latest app or the app that everybody uses to keep the scores updating updated but we have been through the whole 90s and 2000s generation where various websites then apps came giving the cricket score and the one that won was quick buzz the one that beat the whole competition because it used to get updated the fastest and this is not the only reason, I'm sure there are many more, but as a programmer, this will be a severe mistake if you use sign variables for all of them. Are you clear? You don't, your roll number is 25. You don't say your roll number is plus 25. It'll sound foolish if you say that because it can never be a negative number. Similarly, saying that a batsman score is plus 230 is foolish. So that plus every time that you're carrying extra will add the burden to the whole programming and the data transfer, making the operation so. so a good programmer is the one who has a clear idea where to use signed numbers, where to use unsigned numbers. Are you clear? Like the net run rate, that last column of that uh, uh, points table, that is a number that can be positive or negative. That's where you will use a signed number. Are you clear? But in Cricket App, everywhere else, an unsigned number will do the job for you in a more efficient manner. So a programmer decides whether he or she wants to use signed or unsigned numbers by adding the tag signed in or unsigned it. If you write if you write nothing, by default it is signed. So you decide whether you want it to be signed or unsigned. If you use unsigned, you get a bigger range because the whole range is available on the positive side. If you use sign, the range is the same but it gets divided on both sides of CO. So effectively your range becomes half positive and half negative. Are you clear? So only if it's worth it, only if you want negative numbers, you use sign system. I hope you got that. Uh, here the limit that the end number you don't need to memorize you can just put a calculator 2 raised to whatever is the size is that end number or the range are you clear so that was integer the various forms of integer similarly there is float you will learn this and you will love it when you learn this this is called IEEE 754 32 bit format uh, you learn it in COA subject you learn it in 8086 when you learn the math coprocessor you learn it in ARM all modern systems use Floating point numbers, fractions. Fractions are not stored as normal integers in a computer. They are stored in a specialized form. That's called a floating point format. So IEEE, the organization, created three floating point formats. Normal float, that's 32 bits. 32 bits means four bytes. One byte is eight bits. So that's short real, that's single precision format. Then there's double precision format, which is called long real. And there's extended precision format, also called temp real. That's called long double over here. So, 4 bytes for float is standard, 8 bytes for double is standard, long double, different processors because it's already very big. So, it's for high-end processing. So, different processors have different sizes for it. Some have 10, some have 12, some have 14, etc. 10 is the most standard that you learn in your engineering. Anyway, float numbers are always signed. They have a format, sign, exponent, mantissa. I will not get into it. It's a whole subject altogether. You have to store the fractional part separately and the integer part separately. Anyway, so they are always signed. There is a sign bit for that. Now, remember what did I say? What is the drawback of using sign numbers? Your range gets compromised because these are, these are such big data types. And when you learn them, you'll know that they hold phenomenal range that the compromise doesn't really make a difference. 
standardization in fact makes it easier to handle so floats are always signed all right they can always be positive or negative the last data type and the last question of this lecture uh, car data type car data type is a character a single character like a or b or c etc it is stored in its ASCII form just today I got a question so I handed out on my whatsapp uh, that number will be there in the description uh, a third year student learning some advanced subject from me asking this basic question sir uh, we've you've taught us all the numerical because in our programs you work with numbers so you taught us all the numbers converted into binary hex to binary decimal to binary and vice versa but sir how are names stored in a computer See, this is where the basics which are supposed to be embedded right from first semester are missing. Your name, let's say my name, Bharat, B-H-A-R-A-T, six characters. Each character has an ASCII value, A-S-C-I-I. -I. Wherever you can just type a search, not now, you'll get ASCII table. So you get all the ASCII values. So every character is substituted by an ASCII value, which is a number. And that number again is converted into binary, which means zeros and ones. So what may appear as my name, Bharat, on the screen, doesn't really get stored as Bharat. It gets stored as the ASCII character of B, of H, of A, of R, A, T. Are you clear? As numbers. So each ASCII value is one byte. Is one byte. You'll do a lot of programs based on this. Right in C programming, where you go convert from lowercase to uppercase and uh, find a single character and things like that. Character manipulation is a big part of our subject. Anyway, so a char data type holds one character. One character is one byte because ASCII values are one byte. They go from 0 to 255. So these are the primitive or the basic data types of C, integer, character and float. Then there is arrays, structures, unions, Link list or link list is a structure, but anyway, uh, which are derived data types where you can hold big data, like lots of data, not big data, what we say today. Big data is something else altogether. We can hold bigger forms of data, you can hold a cluster of data, but this is not a question based on that, so don't go too deep into it. You can just, like I said, if you're a show off, you can just write these basic things. And I, the difference between an array and a structure is in an array, all the data that you hold should be of the same data type, like an array of all integers, or an array of all floats an array of all characters. An array of all characters becomes a string. A structure is where you can hold different information. Uh, an integer, a character, a float, like the roll number of a student, the grade of the number student, the percentage of a student. This becomes a student structure. Are you clear? Anyway, anyway, you'll see that when you do bigger programming. But here, this is where it ends. So this is all question number one. You know what is left to come? What is coming up? This You can understand this was from the first chapter of C programming, basic chapters. Now, coming up are the big questions. The very next question we'll do. What a question. 10 mark program. Write a program to calculate the roots of a quadratic equation. You understand roots of a quadratic equation means there is going to be a real part and an imaginary part. Minus b plus or minus square root of b square minus 4ac. That discriminant could be negative. So you will see how to work with imaginary part and how to do that calculation, all those various decision making. So that's a big program, but a very common program. So is this. This is unbelievable how many times this program has been asked in various universities. Practically every university paper question, you will see it somewhere or the other a subpart or a full program based on this. Subpart means reversal of a string. Anyway, whenever you do it, you'll come to know. So palindrome, it means check whether a string is the same forward or backward. Like madam, M-A-D-A-M -A -A is the same whether it's forward or backward. The forward and the reverse. Selection sort. Sorry, selection sort. If you play pool, you have a set of those nine balls. What do you do to sort? You pick up nine, put it at the end, you pick up first, put it over here, second, and then that's selection sort. That's what you do. Anyway, so the program based on that algorithm. Uh, binary search, divide and rule policy. Superb searching technique. Anyway, so it's all in the same paper, in this one paper. That's amazing how good this paper was. Factorial by recursion, another. Always you'll find this very, very popular question. Fibonacci by so recursion. So normally you get one of these, but in this paper you had both in the same paper. GCD and LCM, mathematical based question. Uh, add complex numbers using structure. So create a structure. What did I say? A structure will have different parts, different data types. So you can have uh, a real part and an imaginary part of a same number as one structure. So that becomes a complex number. So using that structure model, you create two complex numbers and you add them. Some mean and deviation, again a mathematical based question, but using pointers. 
It's the peak of learning C programming. Pointers and linked lists. The person who knows this knows C properly. When you sit on the interview and you say you know C, your initial questions will be the ones that I told you earlier and then these big ones will come. Now, all of this is there on my website. Uh, I, the remaining paper and the various the whole course of C programming, all the various courses that I do. My website is bharatacharyaeducation.com. We have an Android app, Apple app by the same name, Bharat Acharya Education. Download it, see all the courses. You can select whichever course you want. The fees is the same, 1499 We have clusters, the combo packs, where you have two courses together, where you get a big reduction in fees. Then we have bigger combos, three courses. You have, we have a VIP pack, where you take all the courses and you get a big discount, etc. So select the course you want to take, learn the whole subject. In the C subject, the remaining paper will be there in the C subject, plus the whole subject of C. Like I said, there are more than 30 videos. And each video is like how I said today. I don't rush through a topic. I don't do it for the sake of doing it and uh, there is nothing taught without its real world implication because what's the point of learning all this if you don't understand how it's relevant to you in the real world. How do you, That's how you shape yourself as an engineer and that applies to all the subjects that I teach. Anyway, uh, so these are all my uh, courses. Select the course you want to learn for this video of course it's C programming, go ahead take the course, enjoy learning. Build your confidence right from the beginning of engineering. Be that student from whom everybody else takes the assignment. Don't be in that herd who just copies assignments and misses that whole process, the learning curve of engineering and then slows down the career. When you start learning all this, once you land up, finally land up a job and then you realize everyone is going faster than you because in the time when you're supposed to do it, you were not doing it. So don't be in that position. All right. We are going ahead with our remaining set of questions. Hope to see you there. Wish you all the best. Do well. I really hope you enjoyed learning.